The hardest part about learning chess for me is the middle game strategy. And so I am now going over this book, Improve Your Chess Pattern Recognition, which helps you identify key moves and motifs in the middle game to help you become a better chess player. Today, we're going over the center back knight position, which is a blockading knight that helps the advanced pawns in the center of the board. I'll show you all about it. Let's just jump into it. So in our first game here, we have a game between Igor Bondarevsky versus Vasily Smil Smislov. Old game with some grandmasters there. And it starts off with a Rui Lopez opening here. And as the opening, we get a Morphe defense. And, you know, they play their, their opening. We get to the middle game. So we're, what we have here in this position is this knight and this knight are supporting this central pass pawn that's going to be pushing up towards the center, which is a big problem for black as this pass pawn is going to just wreak havoc in the middle and end stages of this game. So what black needs to do here is get its bishops into the game and possibly get this knight over here on either e5 or e6, stopping the advancement of this e4 pawn. So what we see here is f5 comes here attacking this pawn and white pushes up here on e5. Black then creates this center back knight, which is highlighted by this pawn, this knight in front of a pass pawn, but also has this pawn here, which in the later stages, as this pawn moves forward, the knight's now covering it, and it's a, you're able to create more attacking possibilities in the future. A lot of times you'll see that this knight is here with the two pawns right here. But what's nice about this is it's covering these two advancements, right? But it's also if you have another pawn here on g5, the knight's able to defend that as well. So the bishop drops back after being attacked by the knight. And now because this knight is here defending this pawn, you do have this pawn adequately defended as it goes for the attack, even though you're leaving your king completely vulnerable. So the knight comes back and black continues to just advance his pawns forward and white doesn't have much to say about that. Black just continues to improve his pieces and black continues pushing forward, creating, getting itself a lot of space. And a lot of that is just due right here to the center back knight, stopping the advancement of the center pawn and allowing its other minor pieces to move forward. So white tries to create some counterplay. The king comes over here to F7, getting out of any of the shenanigans from white's knight here and now goes to attack the knight on H5. The knight comes over here to f6. Black just improves his rooks. The rooks are improved and we get some trade off. So despite all the exchanges, white still has a big problem coordinating all of his pieces. You're defending a lot of, you're putting a lot of resources here on this pass pawn. This knight over here is supported by this pass pawn that's really isolated on its own right. White's gonna have a lot of tr trouble protecting the g2 and c2 pawns. And what we have next is black can now start to push this h pawn and attack on his own. So white comes over here to e3 and black continues the attack. It is supported by the center back knight that is super strong. White has to retreat. Black exchanges the knight for the bishop. The pass pawn is there. But at this point, the bishop comes in. It's not gonna be attacking the c2 pawn. And you can't advance this pawn because the king's just gonna take it. So the bishop's dropping back. And black, not even in a hurry right now to attack this pawn, just continues to advance his own pawns. So this knight is now even more in trouble because it doesn't have this square doesn't have this square, doesn't have this square. So bishop now threatening here. White has to force up to f3 to force the bishop to take on c2. So the knight has this escape square here on f2. Black then takes on f3, white takes on f3, and the the game is continued to play on. Black has this heavy advantage. They go on to win, and the main difference here was this knight here on e6. So the center back knight is super strong. It's one controlling all these squares stopping the advancement of this pass pawn and supporting any pawn pushes in the future. Very important piece to have, especially if you're trying to figure out middle game strategy. Of all the early key positions that you learn in this book, this is one that I think I, I internalized the most and I use it a lot in my middle game strategy. So that is a center back knight and how you can use it in your own middle game strategy. But what happens if one of your opponents is using that center back knight against you? So in this game against Justin Powell versus Reebly, we show how white best attack that center back knight to end up bringing the victory to themselves. So we started off the game in a Queen's Gambit style opening, you know, all the fun stuff. White has strong control of the center of the board and black creates some counterplay, but completely basically even out of the opening. The bishops are traded off, black castles, king side attacks the queen and white continues to develop his pieces. And right here, Black jumps in on this this advanced pass pawn, creating the center back knight. One defending these these pieces, controlling these squares. Super strong knight. So white needs to figure out one how to attack this isolated black knight because it's not supported by any pawns. So you're gonna have a much better idea of how to best attack it. 
And one of the ways that White should go about attacking this is getting this queen over here to f4 and getting this rook over here to c6 and just trying to get two pieces attacking this at the same time. That's probably White's best strategy for winning this center back knight. And so what does White do? He comes queen to d4, looking to go to f4 and getting this rook over here to c6. Black tries to defend with a queen trade here, but White follows up with this plan by going over here to f4. Uh, the bishop comes over here to d7. This knight comes here looking to get over here to c6, hopefully trading off this bishop and getting this rook in the game. So after he tries to improve his rook, White gets his knight over here on c6. And we go rook to e1 here looking for possible trades, getting this open. The blockading knight has now left this square. White is now clearly better because you have this annoying move, knight to e7 check on the king. And so what happens here? is black moves this knight deep into white's territory but doesn't really have much of a move and white continues to press on with the attack the knights are traded off this pass pawn is looking real good here the rooks are traded off the queen takes this pawn so we have white still at a very strong advantage but black has the extra pawn so why does white have that advantage because after improving his pieces, we have the knight here now forking the queen in the, in the rook, which seems like it's good for black. But what happens is white has the sacrificial queen on f7 check. After the queen king takes, the rook takes the queen. This knight is hit, and then this rook is hit. You're going to be winning at least one of these pieces. And it was all because white didn't allow black to keep that center back knight and really dictate the terms of that middle game. So that's a blockading knight, why it's super important, how you can use it in your middle game, and why it's very important to get your opponent's blockading knights off the board right away. So if you like that video, you also like this next middle game video here, which talks about the very unconventional knight on the rim. So until then, we'll see you next time. You have a great day. Goodbye.